safety code. And there's a lot of wonderful applications as well in inspection, being able to bring robots in areas where humans can't currently go to the dull, to the difficult, uh, to the dirty. Uh, but for each one of these, I think we're looking at robots that do specific tasks and have been engineered to do those tasks very well. So it isn't about creating uh, the rosy, the robot, some of you might have imagined would be helping you in your home. It's about really solving some of those specific challenges that we're still up to today. So what I hope as a roboticist is that all the things that we've been developing in our laboratories and a lot of the wonderful research that's going on uh, within the European Union becomes a reality so that when I ask this question in 10 years, you all raise your hand and you have used a robot in your work, maybe you have a robot at home, or maybe you have a robot that is helping care for you since we had that discussion on the previous panel. Thank you. Could you pass the microphone to Francesco, please? Uh, because he is working on robots, with robots, producing robots. What do you expect? What is the future of robotics? It's a very general question. Yes. Uh, we started making robots 15 years ago and we started making a kind of rosy, like Sabine said. And uh, our vision after several years is that probably the first robots that we, uh, we can already see here, around here, this vision, are robots that have probably single function. So the robot that we have at all at the moment, for example, the one with Liam, then probably the three person that have robot at home in this day, the application is very clear. And this is very simple. Because you know, from my point of view, we are simple. So what we want to have is something affordable that works, could stay for a long time, and have a clear function. So the first problem that we would have in the near future will be this kind of problem. Then my vision for the 10 years that is the question of, of this panel is that at the moment we, we have to work for the next year to, to have some function that uh, are helpful for for humans, so we have to improve the quality of life. We did, I visit a lot of industry, a lot of companies where the humans at the moment are the robots. So I think that what we have to do using technology is change this behavior. So giving the task to the robots, the repetitive task of this task to robots, every time more intelligent, okay, that would have also a kind of decision regulated by law and standardization, but uh, make the humans think what we are very, very, very good to do, that use our intelligence. So about the application, there are several applications. About, for example, now we are working on retail, for example, and we are doing uh, autonomous inventory. That is something that humans don't want to do, don't want to stay a long time during the night making inventory stuff. And so this is something that we are already doing. And, uh, Several kind of applications like that, I think that is the future of the robots. What is your exp exp expectation? You have been working with the European Commission on, in the field of robotics and AI, and uh, what from manufacturing applications to health applications, what do you think? Were, were, what can we expect? What is, are there new applications popping up? Or? What do we expect? Penetrating the robotic technologies in, in other sectors of industry? Right. I think there is probably a potential for applications of robotics in many, many different domains. I would say everything with you is functioning in your private in your space. Uh, it might even be difficult to predict exactly where it will develop first as being the biggest application. I'm not sure anyone 15 years ago could have predicted that so many of us would have a robotic vacuum cleaner, right? This was not the most obvious application 15 years ago. So what it will be in 10 years or 20 years is very difficult to say, but I am convinced, and I think the will go chance about this as well, that it will penetrate different markets and it will make a big change in our lives in the way we deal with things. Could it be because it will help us with jobs or because it will help us at all. Uh, once and for sure, those robots helping us will have to be intelligent, otherwise they will be, they will not be very useful. And, and they will have a search to be reliable and safe. And those are questions which are still deep 
note on his site. Thank you. A few years ago, we were still in a stalemate between offer and demand in robotics, and everybody was saying um, the robots are too expensive, so they don't find any market. And, uh, and then there was nobody wanted to invest into robotics at that time because they, they said there are no customers for robotics. Now the situation seems to be different, maybe even completely different. Uh, but um, what do you think? Why is the situation different? Uh, why do, is this development now uh, accelerating? Is it profit, uh, which is we expect, or is it altruism, especially when, which is mentioned several times in health, uh, robotics for health, or um, to, to do dirty work? Is this altruism? I, so that's that's a tough question. I, I I think I would like to make a distinction in answering your question between industrial robotics on the one hand and service robotics on the other hand. If you look at industrial robotics, we, we've seen that since the 1960s onwards, there's been a widespread adoption of industrial robots because the price of these robots has been falling continuously. Now, one of the things that also is, is, is kind of backed out by research is that when you look at industrial robotics, there's also what economists call diminishing returns. So it seems to be that adding more robots to, to the manufacturing processes um, is adding less and less in terms of productivity, in terms of value added. So I think if we are going to see a king an explosion in robotics, it will have to come from, from service robots. And there I think we, we should make a distinction between the high-end services uh, and the low-end services. The high-end services you think of, for example, autonomous um, trading platforms in finance, or um, autonomous surgery, or autonomous legal counseling. I think these are doable, or might be doable in, in the near future, at, you know, at relatively uh, cheap costs, or cheaper costs than, than they are possible today. Often in, you know, in combination with demand for skilled workers, such as bankers, high-skilled bankers, high-skilled surgeons, uh, and legal uh, experts. Now, the low-end services, I think there it's, it's going to be much more difficult to get adoption because it's so expensive um, to build robots, um, if possible at all, to do many of these low-end in-person services. Think of a robot dog, dog walker or um, a robot a waiter in a restaurant. Um, and the reason why I think it's going to be more difficult, more expensive to develop technologies to adopt in these industries is because it, there's passive knowledge. So I'll give you an example. We, we all, as humans, we all know how to wait tables in a restaurant. Well, we, we can do that, but we, we don't really know exactly what the definition is of you know, being customer friendly. And you know, if, if even though we can do these tasks, if we cannot define them properly, it's going to be very difficult for robots to also um, do these tasks, uh, even with deep learning in cloud robotics. So I, I see different phases. So I think in industrial robotics, I think you know, the adoption will continue, but there will be diminishing returns, so also less profits, less productivity increases. And in service robotics, I think the first applications will come from in high-end services, um, whereas the low-end services, in-person services, will be um, very hard to automate in the near future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The question remains, is the, is the population more inclined to accept robots? Is this uh, maybe, is it, a reason, is it a result of the vacuum cleaner? Uh, because now the threshold has, uh, has become lower for introducing robots. Uh, Vincent, what do you think? Has to, is there um, more acceptance among the general audience, the general population of robots? Or what do you think uh, is, makes the uh, robotics um, future so gloomy, as, sorry, so, so um, uh, well um, prepared and, um, and also so um, full of expectations? 
expectancy will both this is actually the acceptance is actually higher than we think. Um, I have two examples of that kind of thing. So a couple of years ago we did a show in Zurich with Professor Pfeiffer and lots of his friends. And uh, basically we showed them a couple of very common goals at the time. And there were queues outside of people paying 12 Swiss francs, including their children, to actually just see a couple of the current robots that most of us uh, know. And people were really, really curious to, to, to do a lot of this stuff. And another thing was uh, there was a, a guy in Munich, Martin Bus, who had a, a robot, I think called Ace, that would like, walk from the Marienplatz Central Square Munich to, to the Institute asking people for the way. I was stunned about the fact that people wouldn't think of this as anything particularly remarkable. <laughs> the majority of the people, this was a couple of years ago, the majority of people on the Munich Central Square would just walk past this thing. And, and other people would say, oh yeah, you should go there, but you know, take the traffic light, you know, don't go across here, go over there. They, they behave as if that was the absolutely most common thing to do at all. This was cutting edge research, right? <laughs> and, and so, and children are, of course, even more willing to interact with robots and don't think twice about the cycle. And I think this is, there is an sort of uneasiness about this thing, but I think this is heavily horrible. I think we will interact with these things uh, very, very easily. And particularly if they already seem somewhat familiar, for me, the uh, most important um, type of robot that enters our daily lives is autonomous cars. Right? We don't think of that as a robot, but that is a robot. Right? It has sensors, and traders, and so on and so on. And we don't think of that partic as particularly scary because it's a car. Right? So uh, I don't really expect that to be uh, much of an issue. We would not have terminated robots you know, on, the, on, the, on the forefront of the development. So, I expect that actually the public is quite ready for it. It's, it's the economical questions that Martin mentioned that, that are actually crucial for the output of robots on the streets. The difference between women and men? Is there a difference in, between uh, countries in Europe? Um, is there. A... Yeah. Well, we, we had a new survey a couple of years ago where we basically tried to understand what is the feeling of people in Europe um, against robots. And it's true that the results were a bit surprising because in a way people are not so frightened, you're right. As soon as they see a need and use, you know, something that can be helpful for them, they are probably willing to accept. For example, there were more than 70% if I remember well to, to feel like being operated by a robot search is a very good thing because it gives you better results than you know something else. Perfect. I'm not frightened at all with the opposite. Um, there were no real differences between countries. I think a bit more in the south people are frightened about losing jobs, but I think this is probably normal because at the time of, of, of the, the years, and people in, the, in Spain and Portugal were, were more and Greece in more difficult situations than in the north regarding the environment. So this is to never had any question of will, will a robot take my job or not. Uh, I think this is a bad fear. That's what is important and this is what we are working on with the Commission, is to prepare for this change. So we should not be afraid of the change. We should welcome it, as we welcome all previous industrial revolutions in the past that also brought major changes to society, including employment. Think about steam, think about electricity, thinking about computers. But if we prepare for it, if we make sure that people have the right skills when the day will come that there will be plenty of problems everywhere, this will not be a problem at all. It will even be better because difficult jobs will not have to be performed by people, but just by machines. Yes, Sabine. And I think public perception is also very much driven about what they read in the media and about what they know from science fiction and robot as a special in that respect, because everyone has an idea of what a robot can do. And so I think that there has to be more work on how do we how do we de-type robotics, how do we make sure that we can, can 
mitigate the challenges and limitations that we still are currently facing. And about the neurobarometer survey, I think what was really interesting was this notion that if they interact with robots, then they, they have a much more positive uh, feeling about it. So actually, the only thing that we can do about it is, is have people work with robots on a more regular basis to really understand all of these different aspects. Yeah. I think there is, uh, on one side, we uh, hear there are optimistic um, forecasts on the development of robotics, but um, we all know among our friends and relatives there are people who ask us, do we really need these robots? Do we, do we really want those robots? And, um, and if we compare this with artificial intelligence, and to me, robotics future has is, is intertwined with artificial intelligence. Without it, artificial intelligence, these uh, robots we are dreaming of will not work. So, um, very recently, um, there was a creation of a, a consortium in the US. It's called Partnership on AI to the benefit of people and society. And it was created by Amazon, DeepMind, Google, Facebook, IBM, and Microsoft. Maybe you have heard about this creation. I, I was wondering why they say to the benefit of people and society, as if they had to um, explain that their uh, artificial intelligence is to the benefit. Um, now we were talking about robotics which are to the benefit of the people. Um, why is this, why, do we need this, um, something, a campaign like this in Europe? Uh, to, to say AI and robotics is to the benefit of people? Uh, I would like to concentrate now on barriers for the development of robotics in Europe. What is, are the obstacles? What, is, uh, what do we need? In Europe, and now I'm coming also to our future in robotics. You know, I, we were talking about future of robotics, and now it's, I would like to turn to our future in Europe. What do, what do we need? Uh, is, is the other parts of the population not accepting this? Then I would say maybe we need to think about. Uh, certain activities, like, like European Robotics Week is one of the activities to bridge, you know, from roboticists to the general population. What do you think? Um, I think that, that the kind of thing is needed. Um, there has been a big, very, there's a big fear about AI. AI is scary, it's robots too, but I think AI is more. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, it's essentially the fear that we're sort of we're losing control. Like we've gotten used to the fact that we're not the fastest or the strongest or anything like that anymore. But the smartest, we're still the smartest. We like that. We want things to be that way. So if that's if that's under threat, there's not much left for us. And we used to think in addition that we are at the center of the universe and the ground, the creation, all that stuff. That's also going down the drain. Things are going bad. So we want to keep that last part. And, and so this threatens us. So I think uh, that there is a significant backlash against this kind of things. And so people who talk about singularity, super intelligence, and so on, are really popular because that is a fear that exists. Um, so I think it's really quite important to stress what it is that robotics and AI are doing and why they're beneficial to society and why is that quite different from uh, these kind of concerns and there's you call that dehyping. Yes, I think that, that is important. I think it's also important on a theoretical level to think about in the long run what kind of things do we want for humanity. I used to work in the future of humanity institute so I'm before that. But in the long in the short run, yes I think we, we have a very significant PR problem. And, and people like this, this development are asylum. Yeah, people in the triple AI uh, are scared of losing money because they think, well, yeah, people are going to think that we are these guys who are going to be the beginning of the end of humanity. They will not give us money anymore. They're scared. So that's why they do all this stuff. And I think they have a point.
uh, collecting on suggestions, what needs to be done in Europe? Uh, so, um, I, I think the, the awareness campaign that the European Commission is, is trying to push now is very important, not only from the perspective of you know, the robots are there and there's fears, there's a hive and there's fears about what it's going to do to society, but also the other way around. Like if you have EU Robotics Week, you, know, you, you learn kids you know, to also develop these new technologies, work with these new technologies in the future. And the reason why I stress that is because there is some research in economics that, have actually, that actually shows that development in technologies such as robotics are also endogenous. They're also driven by societal factors. For example, if you go back to the second industrial revolution that started in the 1850s and lasted up to 1980 with electricity, with um, combustion engines and so on. One of the reasons why we think that that technology came about is because uh, there was this, this mass of unskilled agricultural workers that could move to these newly built factories to become machine operators. So in that respect, we think that the second industrial revolution was caused by the societal characteristic that there was a lot of unskilled workers that could become machine operators in these newly built factories with the electrical machines and so on. And then in the, the around 1980, third industrial revolution started, the computer revolution started. And again, economists have, have tried to show that why that came about was because throughout the 20th century we've mass educated our population. So we had now a skilled labor force, and that caused the computer revolution to, um, to actually you know, come about. And that also kind of brings up a concern that I have about you know, expected developments and awareness campaigns and investing in skills. We find it harder and harder to put extra kids into STEM fields, for example. Um, you know, it's, it's the educational attainment rates has to have been increasing throughout the 20th century, but are now you know, that growth is tapering off. So to get an even more educated workforce that can develop and work with these robots is becoming more difficult than difficult. And that's also why I think skills and awareness um, with kids about uh, robots and skills to work with these new technologies is such an important issue for them in general. Uh, can I ask you, Francesco, because you produce humanoid robots where maybe some people may be really afraid of for the future. What is your experience? Well, in the last 10 years, I've seen a lot of improvements about the acceptance from the user point of view, so the people that have to use the robots. So I remember when we put the first three in 2009 in the real environment, and people, the first impression it was scary, so they had fear of the robots. So, what is this? It's a machine, so uh, I have to take care of it. Then there's uh, another thing that is very, from a psychologist's point of view, in my opinion, was very uh, strange, is that uh, when people start to use the robots, uh, there's some kind of aggressivity in uh, our beings, in our human being, that uh, we want to find the face and we want to demonstrate that we are still more intelligent of these machines. So this is another thing that is, is important to take into account. But I, I can tell that these years, uh, with uh, all the introduction of uh, a lot of robots, uh, and now uh, the concept of robots uh, is uh, everywhere. So, so the people are more familiar with these robots. So we have robots already at home. We can see also robots in the street, in the community. And also in Zurich, I remember I was in the robots on a tour, and uh, I've seen the long queue of people and, uh, with the ring who were outside, giving uh, this kind of entertainment to the people. And uh, this is important because, uh, in my opinion, and uh, 10 years ago, I remember as a similar panel, and my, my speech it was about uh, the first risk of not introduction of the robot are human. So, because uh, if we see robotics like Terminator, I remember that someone said that Terminator, uh, the human that is the most aggressive uh, animals on the, on the earth, he will just try to eliminate this risk. 
So now I think that uh, mainly in Europe, European Union make a great job in order to change this this kind of uh, uh, vision that is more occidental vision of robots that could be dangerous for humans or the robot soldier or something like that, and uh, try to put more emphasis on the uh, service robotics. And uh, this is a great job. And uh, in my opinion, what we have to do, we can speaking about careers, is to make more and more collaboration with in Europe because we still have some differences between France, uh, Germany, Spain, Italy. And so I think that the great job that we start doing uh, since ten years or more that you know, the union just was created that has to be pushing more and more and I think that this is the, the right way to do this thing. So I'm very happy and I'm very positive on that because I think that we are doing the, the things in the right way. Heavily involved in public relations, your Robo Hub is one of the most successful um, uh, initiatives in, Europa, in publicizing the robotics. Um, what is your experience uh, about we talking about barriers and then I come to the European uh, Commission afterwards? So I wanted to comment on your use of the word campaign. We've seen two campaigns now backfire horribly. And, and I think we should think about that when we design our science communication strategies. Community, campaigning sounds like we're just talking to the people and they need to know what we're saying, but actually a lot of people in the future won't be the robot developers, they'll be the users, and the users will be women, uh, men, children from across a range of different disciplines. And so what we really need to figure out is what the users want within their own environment, within their own environments. And so I think that's really uh, what we should be understanding now so that when we develop this, it feels like the users are the ones who are controlling uh, the direction of the robotics field. And it's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, so, so I think things like the European Robotics Week are a great way to do this. We're having a discussion now, uh, and we need to open that and even more. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues also related to this uh, new um, partnership in the US is um, the fear, maybe, that the American IT companies, Facebook, Google, and so on, will somewhat build some sort of a carpet, some sort of a conglomerate to collect all knowledge. And, and maybe our European approach is, is different. Uh, and I think some, there's a, a current now I've observed in robotics is the so-called democratization of of results, of um, tools, of standards, um, of also of open source, open access. Um, and do you think there is, a, do we have a, 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 some sort of a, a positive counterbalance to, you know, on one side the huge IT dominating companies, and then on the other side Europe as a um, as a community, the robotics community sharing um, results and also um, taking advantage of the projects of the uh, European Commission. And um, is there a way, what do you think is the European Commission or is your unit thinking about um, pushing more towards open access and open source and so in order to make results available to, uh, to other European partners? It's a lot of difficult questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> where to start? Uh, first of all, I think we have a complex in Europe. We very often believe that things done in Asia and the States are better because they are done elsewhere. This is not true. I mean, Europe has a lot of advantages on many things, but also in robotics. We have an excellent research base. We have plenty of good companies, estimates, and startups. And we are very dynamic, and I think we should really remember that more than you are always thinking because something comes from the States, suddenly this is interesting. What do we this, you know, this consortium of companies, but if the same happened with this report from the White House on AI, and so we, this was you know, the kind of best in the world. We did enough, but not a good work as well in Europe. 
on the mission, for example, thanks to EU COP in the last years, but also thanks to SPA for the moment. I mean, SPA is a unique partnership where we have all the stakeholders of Europe, industries and academics, working together with the public agencies in the European Commission. And honestly, I don't see why this setup is not as good as this conglomerate of uh, European industries in, in, in the States. So I think we should really stop with this kind of feeling that we are we are weak. This is not true. We also have the largest civilian funding program in the world in Europe for robotics, and we put more money than Asia than the States. So I mean, for sure we can develop plenty of policies there. Now it's all about finding indeed the right balance between being totally open and giving away our results and making sure that the results benefit people in Europe. And this is a difficult question. But personally, this is my personal view. I've been a researcher, I don't believe in science in isolation. So we cannot just do science in Europe and ignore what's going on elsewhere. It's been not to work out because it's perfectly natural that people are going to the United States or with Japan or wherever else. So this is the first one. We have been on committee projects for quite a long time now to consider open source to make their uh, results available widely. The application should be you know, uh, on the website, people should be on easy access and so on. Of course, if you do that, the risk is that someone somewhere else than in Europe can reuse the thing. The biggest problem is that, especially with the states, I don't think that the mechanism is really broken. So they have a different way to deal with research and public funding, especially with DARPA, and because they mainly fund military things and they keep the research for themselves. So, okay, that's an issue. Um, I mean, open source is good, sometimes it has limitations if you want to really improve the competitiveness of the European industries. We also have to accept that maybe public funding is kept limited to a certain amount of people for two or three years so that those people can develop a product or something which is very close to a product and then go on the market. With Horizon 2020, I think we made a lot of efforts towards that direction. We, now, we are now funding not only research but also innovation, but I would like to make it very clear it's not just innovation, it's research and innovation. So we are really funding the whole spectrum and we try to support as much as we can people in Europe to do something good, good for the competitiveness of our industries and, and creating jobs and keeping jobs and good for the well-being of citizens. So it's both aspects and we should not be shy about it and I think we're quite good at it, honestly. I mean, that's, I know I'm all for the VC, so maybe, but I'm really convinced that we are uh, could you pass the microphone to Francesco? Because I will, he is the, the industrialist in this panel. So, um, what is your experience? Um, what would you like to say about uh, the community of European uh, robotics manufacturers, for example? Yeah, I expect <laughs> And uh, I completely agree that we need more and more collaboration. So, this is uh, something that uh, always I said that. Uh, Maybe also in science robotics that is uh, so complex, but right? because it's not uh, an, an environment uh, one hundred percent control, so we need to collaborate. So we have a lot, a lot of big experience in the university. But then, from industrial point of view, or from company point of view, there's a big gap. Still, we have a big gap between the very, very good research that we have in Europe and what we can see in the market. This is a reality, and I think that the mission of the companies, and not only the big company, because, for example, the partnership in the US was with very, very big, large company, but I think that in Europe our model is that we, we have to push also the middle of the small company in order to make it, because sometimes the agility, flexibility, and the speed of big company is not the same of a small company that could make it straightforward. So this is something that I think that is different from the US and Europe and I, I really love the European model. And um, then from collaboration point of view, 
there's still a lot of fear in order to, this is mine, why I have to share it, uh, what, what will be the difference, and this is something that I was going to speak before, that is uh, about uh, fear in this money, so losing money, so people still uh, see that uh, for some point of view, in robotics, still we are several companies that are losing a lot of money, and uh, this is a fear that we have to try to, to put in the right way, making a, a sustainable business model and, uh, and also have a robot that uh, works for a long time. So uh, I've seen during this, this year from the first uh, uh, framework program one up to now the new innovation that you planted. Uh, for example, in our company, we didn't attend uh, up to uh, FP6 because we, we just have seen that it was more or less more pure research. And so we started uh, applying from the FP7 because we have seen this change that it was more market oriented. And so what, what I think that this has to be done is uh, to, to give some money to some crazy project, but always uh, thinking on a business model because I think that we need, uh, from the robotics point of view, so robotics is also from robotics manufacturing, we need to add more and more robots because we have to create the market. The market is, is now. We have to create it, so there's a lot of things that has to be done, and there's a lot of space for a lot of companies. So, so we have to collaborate and put it together and uh, work together. So I see a lot of vibrant startups, at least well, all around Europe, but also in the Bristol area where I work. There's a whole incubator, and I see a lot of these startups embracing this idea of openness. So, for example, Open Bionics, 3D Prints, Prosthetics, and all of their plans are open partners with people all around the world can print their own prosthetics if they wanted to do so. The reality is people usually don't because they don't have the different printers and everything that goes with that. But what I really see is that this, it's, there's not really a European view or a US view. I think that it's very global in the way young entrepreneurs are, are tackling some of these challenges. And they think in a global way as well because they will need to raise funding globally, they will need to sell their products globally. And I think robotics, because we've all traveled, because we are community building this together, um, has, has a very global mindset. And so I, I'm encouraged to see that in Europe there's a lot of startups which have this innovation drive, have this desire to be the next big robotic startups um, who are going to succeed. And I think they really have a chance to do that. The thing that's tricky for them, and I, I'm hearing this from some of the colleagues in my office, is, is the investment side. And so there, there needs maybe to be a little bit of risk taking in Europe and having some of the big companies that invest in the smaller companies so that they feel like they can stay in Europe and be the Googles of tomorrow, but here, here in Europe. And so that might just be the missing, like right now we're growing up these startups and we need that extra step so that they can they can stay here. I must say something that is different is that I feel like the European Commission supports startups uh, very well here uh, compared to other places. So it's sort of that step between now that you have the product, where do you go with that? And that's where the European companies need to step in. Thank you. This is a bridge to the next topic. What is the society uh, like in 20, 30, or 40 years? I mean, we've been talking about robotics now. Uh, Martin, uh, you are my crown witness. Uh, what do you think is the rapid employment has been already mentioned by Alan? Um, but uh, what, what is there, um, I mean, we need to be happy if maybe Europe is getting more entrepreneurial, maybe. So is the society more mobile, more dynamic, as maybe people from the economics would say, or hope? Um, is, are we, uh, is this, a, or is this a, will we be an area for uh, further development? Are there populism now growing, and is this a, the passive Yeah, I, I, I'm personally, I, I'm a mindful optimist. Um, I mean, the, the starting point must be that robots are an economic windfall. Um, so if you go back to, to the start of the technological revolution, you know, we are so much better off than our ancestors 200 years ago, and that is due to technological progress. For example, you know, we work now, we work 
way fewer hours than our ancestors a uh, hundred years ago. However, so, so, and you know, I think that's important to keep as a starting point that in principle technology is a windfall. We can all become better off. However, what is also true, and this is a challenge, is that research has shown that recent technological progress is not directly improving, and that's an economist way of saying that actually there are some groups in society that are getting poorer because of technological progress today. And here, the, the, why that happens is not something that is out of our control, but it's, it's entirely uh, within our control. It, it depends on the society that we build around that technology, uh, these uh, advances in technology. And just to kind of make that clearer, let's think of the following analogy. So think of another thing on the windfall, um, natural resources. And think of two countries, Norway and Saudi Arabia, they both have oil resources. But if you look at the society that we build around these resources, they're completely different. In Norway, you have an inclusive society with labor force participation over 80% for men as well as women. In Saudi Arabia, you have 90% so of private employment in Saudi Arabia are foreign nationals that are hired by these few guys that, have, that own the oil resources. And whatever um, Saudis are employed, they're employed in, in low productive, low paid uh, public employment and services. You know, with a lot of inequality, with a lot of um, dissatisfaction as a consequence. So that shows you that you, know, you can also really mismanage economic windfall, uh, not only uh, natural resources, but also the productivity gains that come from automation you know, can be mismanaged. And so it's so what we do with robotics and the impact it has on society is under control of you know, the society that we build around it, whether we want it to be inclusive or exclusive, you know, in relation to inequality, etc. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm mindful of this. So there is, there is clearly a gain from robotics, um, but it's also there's also this risk that you know some groups in society are actually hurt by technological progress. And you know what are we going to do about it to um, not make that happen? And that's that's a difficult question for policymakers. For myself as a researcher, I think you know, to also start answering these policy questions, we need to know a lot more. You know, we need to know, you know what the impact is of robots not just on jobs, but also on households, on marriage, on fertility, uh, etc. We don't know much about it, but if you want to think about you know, the benefits of robotics and how we as a society can reap the benefits of robotics, we need to have answers to those questions as well. There is some research now that looks, for example, at the impact of globalization, so for example, China becoming uh, one of the most important trading partners on world markets and what that has an impact on households. So, you know, on, on marriage rates, on fertility rates, in households that are hurt by in terms of the job losses, um, by this, this, this globalization. And I think for technology, we don't know much yet, but I think it is almost impossible that it's not going to be important if you think about robots, not just in affecting the jobs that we do, but also the robots that we use in our households. And I would like to know a lot more about it, and I think once we know that, we can start answering uh, important questions about how do we deal with the benefits of robotics uh, in an inclusive way. Vincent, to comment on this, what is your view about the society of the future, and what is the, do, do you see the Europe as a chance for becoming some sort of a Norwegian model, or are we getting a Saudi model? <laughs> Roughly the same. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. I can basically agree with what Martin said. It, it, it's clear that robotics and automation, generally speaking, generate more wealth. So, what you call the windfall. Right? So, that's a positive development for society overall, and it allows you to do more positive things for the society. So, it's then a political question. How we do that successfully, uh, sustainably, in such a way that it's actually beneficial for uh, the members of the society. Uh, 
how that's going to pan out, no, I don't know. Right? I mean, I have an idea where I would like it to go, uh, but things go wrong in, in some ways. And where I would agree again with Martin is that things go wrong, particularly if you get unfairness and disadvantage for certain groups of people. So that's something you want to avoid. If that happens, and there will be a backlash of some sort of things like that. That's just political advice, it's not prediction. Can I ask anybody else? Maybe um, I also would like to come to the final round, uh, but um, everybody please think about the one sentence. What is your desire? What do you want? What is, what is your suggestion as an action? I mean, not as a, uh, as a possibility, but what do you think the uh, list of to, the to-do list should look like? For all of us, maybe for the association, the robotics, maybe for Spark, maybe for the European Commission, but for, for all of us. But uh, first, uh, any thoughts about this um, development of the society? In terms of robotics, we will see different um, types of jobs. Uh, work will be different, maybe from today's job, but it also has to do with optimization. Uh, statistics and um, forecasts about uh, what jobs will be needed and what jobs will be lost. This is um, getting more and more mature, this type of research. Uh, Oxford, for example, the papers. Um, is there anything you would like to add to uh, your participation of future ideas, Francesco? Uh, One thing that we have not commented yet is about the the job. So a lot of people are scared. The fear is that uh, robots will uh, make uh, unemployment bigger. So the, the data that uh, are now I have seen, the several percentages, I'm not an expert, I'm not an economist, but the data that I've seen is that a normal robot is feeling a lot of jobs, so the, the job is growing. And from the from uh, from another side is what we are not taking into account is that uh, we are in a continuous change. So we are to be the only things that we know is that tomorrow we have to change, like company mentality, business model, also European Union change a lot in these years, and everybody has to change because we have to change our mind. And what I have seen also inside the company. We are a small company, 50% okay? so, but we have seen that a lot of new jobs are growing up because of the needs of the market. So, uh, if you speak about 20 years ago, speaking about UX, so user experience, engineers, this was something that was useful. Why do I need this? So, we create, because of the needs of the market, a lot of new jobs. And so, I think that we have to. to and this is also an auspicious thing, so this is that we have to make the robot, make the robots so what they are able to make better. So for example, a robot that can see uh, with a, a better frame rate, we have a camera sensor that will make something beautiful and make humans what we are able to do that is about intelligence. And so not to be scared about jobs because we will have uh, jobs for long times. We have just to take into account that these kind of jobs uh, some kind of job will be disappeared and the new ones will be in the future. I suggest that Martin is uh, uh, responding to this issue and to conclude with your sentence on the other to do list and then I will go around for a blank more. Yeah. So on, on the jobs issue, um, I think a couple of years ago there were, there were these fears that in 2035, 50% of all our jobs will be gone. And I think, you know, if you look at that, that study carefully, the policy study carefully, I think, you know, there's, there's lots of things wrong with the methodology that they use for long such predictions. And by now, over the, over the last couple of years, um, we've been able to create a much more nuanced picture in the sense that, yes, there might be certain types of jobs that are lost, but there are also many jobs that are created because of technology and including robotics and in that we think that you know, there's job creation, not job destruction. But again, you know, behind that net number, what we do see is that there's churning in the occupational structure. So for example, the, um, 
and machine operators you know, that got their jobs in the second industrial revolution, car assembly line workers, they're now losing their jobs because of further automation of assembly lines. Um, and you know, what kind of jobs do they do? Well, they go into um, these low paid in person service jobs, they become waiters, they become uh, cleaners. Um, and of course, you know, that's a risk, and these are also the risks that I've talked about, that you know, technology today might actually be making some households poorer rather than richer. Um, and that's why I think, so I have a, in terms of policy mix or takeaway actions, it's, it's a two-tire policy mix that I would suggest. And the first component is exactly to make sure that we, we protect these households um, that are actually suffering from technological progress, that are losing their jobs in the medium paid manufacturing um, paths and towards the, the, the non routine universal service shops that have to get me in ultimate, such as waiting tables or cleaning uh, rules. The second part of my policy would go back to what I said before about the importance of skills acceptance, also. Um, so, you know. For robotics to be successful, um, I think we need to be very aware that you know, we will always be developing these robots, we will be using these robots either you know, as core workers or you know, consuming robots as end, as, as, um, end consumers. And I think you know, policies towards, for example, investing in STEM, policies towards you know, initiatives such as the robotics week to do something about awareness. Um, are also very important. So I have a two tire policy to focus on skills, acceptance, awareness on the one hand, and then on the other hand, also make sure that we have the right policies, any kind of question about social security policies, uh, to have the right policies in place such that um, we are reducing the risk as much as possible for households becoming poorer uh, from ongoing technological problems. Thank you. Vincent? Your one sentence on the to-do list. Place for EU robotics. For the, yes, the community. And, and the community is, I would say, awareness of the fact that you are social agents in a society. And that ultimately, what you will do will be judged only by one criteria, which is benefit of society. Comma not technological advance, profit, or anything like that. Thank you. So, and what's one sentence? We need to make people dream, but in a realistic way. So my dream is that I can spend my whole day speaking with my students and doing research and events in the future. And I would like a tool that helps me diminish the amount of email that I have. And I think if you talk to care dictators, if you talk to people who are stuck in traffic all day, they will have a tool that they'd like develop that would allow them to, to reach their dream. And I think we need to make them dream. A very personal wish, not the easy wish. Could anyone develop a cute, small, cheap humanoid I could have at my flat in the next 10 years, please? So, Francesco, you want to say something? Please pass the microphone to him. My sentence is very easy. Is uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to build uh, a small human robot, <laughs> high level human robot, service robot that can help us improve our quality of life. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your participation in this panel. And I open now the questions from the audience. And please uh, come here and take the microphone. So, the order from here, you will. Hi, uh, I'm Ana Maria from Romania. Um, two, is two issues that I would like to address. First of all, I think we started the discussion from the premises that there are only good people and that robots will only be used for good. Uh, myself as a consumer, I have a problem. I think robots will be on the market in the next years more than they are today. And I'm thinking, what if I want to buy a robot, like I have now one at home? Uh, who's going to tell me if it doesn't have a software in it that makes it steal stuff and hide it or spy on me or whatever else? Because I'm not good at technology, so how can I know if that purchased item won't do harm on me? 
the other <laughs> uh, the other thing is uh, cyber security because it has software. We saw like a month ago the thing in US with the Internet of Things, uh, the cyber attack. Again, uh, we need something to think of to protect the consumers from this. And regarding jobs, uh, I have, uh, I'm also looking into this thing because um, I think it will do harm on vulnerable groups. I think it would deepen their uh, their state of poorness in which they are. I'm I'm thinking, for example, um, in the case of Romania, the transition deepened this gap. I mean, made people poorer than they were, and some of, some of them richer. I think uh, this kind of technology might lead to the same result. I'm thinking of uh, people that, for example, are truck drivers uh, in Germany, for example. Germany is very likely to adopt the autonomous cars. We've seen Uber uh, already driving the, the truck. So they will come back home and they will never be able to learn new digital skills to enter the, the, the labor market. And they will be at an age like 40 or 50 when nobody will hire them as uh, waiters or something else. So that's my okay. view on that. Thank you all. Okay, I will summarize two questions. One is on the privacy and uh, security issue, and the second one is on polarization, which Martin is studying. But I start first, who wants to answer the um, question on uh, spy? Do you have a smartphone? Do you have a smartphone? Yes, but I have protection for that. Yeah, and that's exactly the same. It's all about what kind of protection we can send you to the system. The robot is not more dangerous than this. Okay. Yes. It's about, you know, if anything goes to the market, it will be certified. I mean, like we have now CD certifications. So it will have to go through tests. There will be laws, there will be standards, there will be plenty of things and regulation, and we will not just get something which does whatever it wants by itself. It will do what it has been programmed to do and what you will tell the system to do. So there is not much difference. The only difference is that the level of maturity on how to certify and to regulate in the field of robotics is not in the same stage yet than for other technologies. But there are plenty of initiatives in Europe to discuss those things, including the working group at the European Parliament for the moment, where they are addressing those issues to, to be sure that we have the right regulatory framework when the time will come. And in the Commission, which is launching a new policy which is called digitalizing the European industry, and one of the pillars there is exclusively dealing with this issue of regulatory. So those things are taken into account and I can guarantee you that if anything goes to the market in Europe, this will be safe and you will be able to use it without any fear. Okay, can I add something quick to that? Mm -hmm. uh, ideally that's not important. <laughs> right, so, but of course you were right to point out that there are, as you say, about people that are people with interests and as a matter of fact, your smartphone is fine. Right. You know, your, your location, your, your contacts, uh, where things are sent to this app that you want just to figure out what the weather's like tomorrow. Right. So there is a political problem there, and it's, there are market forces working in different directions. So we are working on it, but it's not that this is going just fine. No, no, but what I wanted to say is that I don't see a big difference between what we have already now and what it will be throughout the system. Right, so just get worse. Yeah. Hey, I mean, yes, but you know, Facebook, if you would have come with the Facebook concept 20 years ago, I would have that shot, but I will never give all the rights of my pictures and anything I say to an American company. But people just do it all day long, so. We are talking about the optimum scenario of yeah, exactly. uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, uh, polarization. Yeah, so um, I think every episode that we've seen of technological progress starting from 1800 until today, they, it has come with, with enormous adjustment costs on labor markets, changes in jobs that we do. 
um, that potentially could make you know, some jobs obsolete and some households for some. And especially today, uh, we think that the ongoing the digital revolution is causing what we call job polarization of labor markets and machine operators that are newly paid workers. They're disappearing, office currents as well. And relatively speaking, we do some more high end jobs, but also um, low paid jobs as waivers, cleaners, etc. Now, the question is whether you could just, and the question is whether you could just leave it to markets without intervening in terms of regulation or not. And my, my reading of, of the literature, it's very difficult to speculate for the future, but my, my reading of the past literature is that it might take a long time if you just let markets take care of these poor households. And you could say, well, in the long run, these poor households, some way or other, will also benefit from the most progress. Um, no, if you go back to again, the Industrial Revolution, what you saw is that fertility started rising. And it kept rising and wages didn't rise. And it took 50, 60 years for wages to pick up uh, in line with fertility. And, and the reason was that you know, initially you know, technology wasn't very standardized. You know, there, there were many different applications of, of uh, all sorts of machinery. But then gradually standardization of technology um, came along. And with that standardization, also skills became mobile. That was there was a labor market now, and workers were able to form unions, etc. And it's those institutions that really allow these poor households to um, become better off. And the question is whether we need similar times of, of uh, regulation today to make sure that these poor households um, are protected as well. One good example, I think, is it's not the point of the economy. You know, if you think about you know, all these like on um, Uber taxi cars. For us as consumers, that's great. But you know, it's it's not immediately clear whether these, these taxi drivers are actually better or off or worse off. You know, if they just have to be you know, stand by all the time, they, 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 you know, they, 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 their income is less because the price of the taxi cab ride is, is, is lower. And again, you know, the question then is you can wait and do nothing and try to and, and hope that these households will get better. Uh, of the long run, or you can try to somehow intervene and protect um, at least the income, some sort of income security for these poor households. If I may ask, uh, sorry, if I may uh, put something on the to do list, that is uh, democratization. This means also inside Europe we have differences in rich and poor countries, and this is one we should level out these. Uh, so robotics for everybody, even for Romania, uh, if they all should take part in this technological development and no country left behind. That's my, uh, my item on the to-do list. Uh, I would like to come um, with the next, there were so many questions here and we have still have 15 minutes time, so please be short and yes. I just want the transcription. You said that the Samsung truck drivers will lose their jobs and won't find out. Um, we should also consider new jobs that will be created because automation and automation does not only kill jobs, but we can we get higher production levels. With higher production levels, the cost of production sinks, so we can actually get production back into, for example, Germany. Production which until then has been in, I don't know, um, Ch any Chinese country or uh, Japanese, so we can actually get production back, and with this production, we can create new jobs. Yep. And also, we know that jobs. Production should okay. have new, better Next question, robots. Any questions? Uh, so, this is kind of related to the polarization thing that uh, I was talking about, uh, especially that robotics seems to be at least. Uh, Kind of developing this view, I actually want you to change my view. I don't think it's correct, but uh, robotics seems like this um, liberal project for uh, the richer uh, parts of society, for the richer parts of society, that opens up new jobs for them and kills off jobs for the poorer uh, parts. Um, one, what are the like? You were talking about, uh, for example, income security. Do you see universal basic income as a, a part of the solution to this puzzle, or is that not? 
on the on the bus. Sabina, please. So that would be I think more people need to be literate technology. It would be great if there were more engineers, but I also think more people just need to be nice and you know, have empathy. And so I don't think everyone needs to be an engineer, and I don't think everyone... Uh, I think we really need to rethink value. So I think in the future we will be giving value to things that we don't currently give value to, like caregiving, like educating children. A lot of old pan society is already left behind by the value system that we've imposed on them. That comes from a very historic where you need to make something and that's what has value. And we see that in a lot of the creative fields right now, which people pay for performances, they pay for a lot of things that we didn't pay for 10, 15 years ago. So my hope is that actually we'll be much more creative in what we assign value to, and that might allow a whole population of people who aren't the engineers, aren't the people who are trained in technology, to bring value in a new way. And so I'm hoping that that will allow people to really value themselves. But it is a tricky thing we need to be very mindful of the inequalities, because that will obviously be a problem for robotics as well. I think in order to make this optimist scenario uh, become realistic, it requires uh, education, it requires uh, taxation, it requires so many different things, uh, we have to work on that. And this is certainly part of this uh, European ideal. And I feel there is, um, uh, robotics is only one part. We could also talk about pharmaceutical research or any other thing where um, there may be the danger of uh, um, having a concentration of power and capital and so on and so on. Um, this is uh, true, we have to, but this is all in what I call democratization of uh, technology and also um, have, uh, give the chances and opportunities to everybody. Now, are there any questions? Philip? Yeah. Here's the microphone. Uh, I, have... <coughs> I have so um, This is for the whole panel. Um, so, slightly more future facing. Uh, question. I think that with these new technologies, we're kind of entering what I would call a brave new world. And I think it's redefining uh, the, the kind of relationship that technology is redefining perhaps who we are as uh, a species as well. Um, I think this touches upon the kind of democratization of the technology uh, and the inequality aspect. You know, I really see that uh, in a certain number of years' time, uh, humans will have the ability to uh, augment themselves. Um, there's um, one example of where I called Neil, I think, Carpenter, who's the first um, cyborg who walks around with an antenna attached to her head. I don't know if you're familiar with him. There are, there, okay, so there are technologies like, like CRISPR gene editing. Uh, so the question is, do you think that um, our relationship, the changing nature of the relationship with the technology is kind of uh, a redefining moment in the way that we evolve as a species as well? Yeah. Uh, I, my view on that is that Andy Clark is right to trip for some time ago with the title of Natural Born Cyborgs. Um, so he, he thinks that we are already cyborgs. This is just a natural thing for humans. Our cognitive and motor skills have been, will be enhanced by tools and add-ons. So it's not something odd to wear glasses, you know, I'm wearing a contact lens, uh, we could have a slightly more sophisticated system in my eye that would allow to see better. That's just a conventional uh, thing that a human species does. So the answer to the question is no. Right? It's, we're not changing the human species. Now, we, we will be changing more things. Right? So uh, I went to a workshop recently on 3D bioprinting. So we will probably try to be able to digitally fabricate more biological tissue. Uh, in complicated ways, uh, and that will integrate with robotics uh, to some extent, which is currently non bio, of course. Uh, but it's it's a kind of thing that really seems really odd to us. Uh, 
we see a lot about it, but, but I think that we will get used to that. And it's like my mother used to say when I was two, we should we be sleeping in the same room with that thing, meaning the computer? <laughs> and you know, that, that's now the kind of thing we think of as really weird. And I think something similar is going to happen. I think we come to the conclusion. Is there anybody who wants to say something? Otherwise, I I think uh, it was clear we were just scratching on the surface of many problems. Uh, we avoided technology. We went to applications. We went to barriers uh, of robotics and chances and opportunities. And at the end, we came back to ethical questions, which were also covered in the previous panel. I think it all requires us as citizens who are responsible, taking up responsibility, making sure this democratization process is actually taking place and that um, we actually will be able, our children and grandchildren will be able to, to, to see this um, optimist scenario become true. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much again for the panel, to the panel, to the panelists. And uh, if you are interested in more questions, then we are here for the coffee break. Otherwise, um, thank you very much. <laughs>